It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, for being here. I'm not the only Westchester University uh, alum in the crowd. Uh, a good friend that I haven't seen in several years, uh, Nora Riley, is here with her family, whose uh, son I know is interested in becoming a Tar Heel from Pennsylvania. So welcome uh, to you and your family. So uh, Bruce, thanks for the wonderful introduction and couldn't think of a better day to be talking about how we've bridged uh, this work in, in sport concussion with the military and uh, my great colleague Jason Mihalik is going to really uh, take off in that area. I'm going to sort of tee it up for him a little bit, talk a little bit about concussion, defining it a little bit of, of what we've done in this area over the past several years. Uh, but a, a great day to, to celebrate uh, some of this work uh, that that's sort of really is helping to advance the science in military uh, medicine. Uh, it's rare to pick up a newspaper in a given week or uh, open up the uh, your uh, computer and, and uh, browse it and, and uh, the word concussion is going to show up. Uh, there's a lot of uh, good information on this topic. Oh, I see there's another Westchester alum. My wife Amy just showed up. Thank you. There are two, there are three of us here. Okay, welcome. So um, at any rate, uh, headlines can be misleading and uh, the media, what you need to know is that uh, uh, that, that bad news unfortunately sells uh, newspapers and uh, but there's a lot of good things happening on this topic uh, and so we really it's part of our job at the Confeller Center is to educate the general public about this topic because much of what you read here much of what you're going to see in this movie concussion that's going to come out on Christmas Day uh, is probably uh, oftentimes uh, you know the question is is it fact or fiction and so um, some of the concerns uh, have been centered around this issue of CTE chronic traumatic encephalopathy which uh, is a, a condition that uh, some individuals believe is caused by repetitive uh, concussions or repetitive sub-concussive impacts that, that are seen in uh, former NFL players, former hockey players. Uh, some of our work is centered around this. Uh, what I tell you on this topic is that uh, we haven't uh, connected the dots. We haven't even, even begun to connect the dots on this, and there's a lot more that's unknown than there is known about it. And it's, uh, it's causing a lot of parents to pull their kids uh, off of playing field, not just football. Uh, as you'll see, I'm going to put some of the statistics up here about concussion in general. Uh, at the youth level, and um, there are other sports and beyond football in which we see concussions. So, uh, again, uh, we need to do a better job of educating our uh, the, the, the general public on this topic. But obviously, one of those concerns and questions is the, the cumulative risk for uh, for our young athletes and whether or not uh, kids should be playing contact or collision sports. And uh, I'm proud to say that a lot of our work is centered on this. We have a a large CDC funded project right now uh, here in uh, the Chapel Hill area looking at concussion uh, and uh, just sub-concussive impacts uh, using accelerometers in, in helmets of these young athletes. Uh, it's a three-year study in three local high schools and we're going to uh, really try to modify or change the way in which uh, they block and tackle to see if that intervention could perhaps uh, be a game changer in improving safety in youth sports. And uh, Jason's done a lot, uh, not only in football, but in hockey. Being from Canada as he is, this is a uh, hockey's uh, obviously really important. Uh, I, I literally took a snapshot of this this morning off of uh, my d dining room table. This is an article that uh, came out uh, uh, two or three weeks ago and someone uh, gave me a hard copy of it, but youth football thrives in Chapel Hill. And uh, we have uh, great youth leagues here, but I can tell you that one of the reasons why it's thriving here is that there's a lot of attention being paid to safety. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in many regions around the country, they don't have the resources and don't have the, uh, the, the medical personnel there uh, and the educational components to make sure that football can be safe. And this is where there are problems. So part of our work at the Gefeller Center is really getting the word out to USA football, to Pop Warner football, so that we can spread this information more broadly. And so uh, I'm proud to say that, uh, that, that it's working here. I, I was one of about eight fathers that started the, the Orange County Pop Warner Football League about eight or nine years ago. And all three of my boys have, have played football. Uh, and to, my, to our knowledge, not one of them sustained a concussion playing football. Uh, I want to just sort of quickly show you what a concussion is, because that's uh, you know, the word concuss simply means to shake violently. And if you think this is just looking at this in one view, uh, but you can see the brain sort of sloshing inside the cranial cavity. It's surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid, uh, and so it compresses that fluid. And uh, uh, depending on uh, where the individual is hit, the brain can rotate. It can move in that direction. Uh, it'll cause some shearing of the, of the neurons that are there. Um, recognizing that the good news about concussion is that it is a, a short-lived injury, meaning that it will uh, recover fairly uh, quickly, meaning that typically within about 10 to 14 days. Um, but 
with that movement, uh, we, uh, we have to think about what's happening at the level of the neuron. So the, human, the average human brain has about 86 billion neurons, 86 billion neurons, and this is what a neuron looks like. And if you think about that movement of the, of the head, one of the things that, that happens is you get this stretching and sort of this uh, shearing of the, uh, of the neuron, and the axon, which is the center part here, can swell with injury, and if it's not pro managed properly, it can dissolve. Now, some individuals will say, well, if we have 86 billion of these, we have plenty to go around, right? Well, it depends how many times you're hit, depends how many concussions you've had, it depends how many times it's been inappropriately managed, uh, because over time, you can have these neural pathways that are disrupted uh, that can lead to, to problems. Now, one of the challenges that we have is that we cannot see concussion on imaging. It's one of the very few injuries that, that, that we treat as sports medicine clinicians that we can't see on an image. And um, the, the good news is, is that we are beginning to develop technologies here. So uh, if you ever have an opportunity, uh, we have, uh, in my opinion, the very best state-of-the-art um, neuroimaging center, biomedical research imaging center on our campus called Marsico Hall. It opened about 18 months ago. Uh, and we have uh, the most sophisticated uh, imaging uh, capabilities there. And some of the work that Jason and I are doing uh, is to gather baseline information on individuals before they've had an injury and then to image them post-injury. This is a big project that's funded, and Jason's going to talk about it, so I'm not going to steal his thunder. But it is funded by the Department of Defense and the NCAA. They've partnered on this grant. And we are able to look at this, and the different colors here represent these white matter tracks, and where we see uh, blue, this represents a disorganized pathway uh, within the brain. And so we're getting closer to being able to finally see these mild injuries uh, on neuroimaging. I also like to emphasize that helmets do not prevent concussion. Uh, that, that's a mis A lot of individuals think that helmets prevent concussion. They do a wonderful job, probably 99.9% .9 of the time, of preventing catastrophic brain injuries, so skull fractures and, and, and ruptured blood vessels. And uh, Jason and I have spent a lot of time working with colleagues like Dave Halstead here, who is a, uh, a, a biomechanist and runs a research lab out of ten down in Tennessee, right outside of, outside of the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And uh, Dave's a, a funny guy, a character probably to say the least. And um, he talks about the material that we really need uh, to prevent both concussion and to prevent uh, these catastrophic brain injuries. The material that, that, that we need to build that helmet is called inobtainium. Uh, and so uh, we, through our advanced materials work that we're doing here, our new Department of Applied Physical Sciences and Biomedical Engineering, I'm going to prove Dave wrong someday. We will uh, find that material to be able to do this uh, so that J he can no longer put that uh, joke out there. But at any rate, uh, some of the work, and, and you can see uh, Jason here setting up a, uh, a helmet on this thing. It's called a linear impact device, and uh, this thing shoots off. At, we can set this at just about any velocity uh, at any location on the helmet, and it sits on this uh, uh, mechanical head form here that has these accelerometers placed at the center of mass of the head. And we can measure the ability of that helmet to dissipate or mitigate the forces that are driven into the, to the skull and ultimately to the brain to try to mitigate that movement that I had shown you earlier. So some of our work, I think, will eventually lead uh, to a better helmet. Uh, fortunately, we're doing this better today than we did in 1912 uh, because this is how they used to test helmets uh, uh, back in the day. So uh, we've come a long way. Uh, and just to sort of illustrate this for you, um, that uh, even with a helmet on, you'll see there still is movement of that brain. And so you get... So, I don't know if it's, I don't even know if it's showed on my laptop, but the, the, you still get this movement uh, of this... Uh, did I take a cord or... Uh, no? Okay. So, let me say a few things. Uh, my, my last two or three slides before we bring Jason up here, I, I can just talk through for you. Uh, we... There is not a concussion crisis right now. Uh, because of this, uh, that the media talking so much about concussion, there are no more concussions occurring in our playing fields today uh, than there was uh, 15 or 20 years ago. What I, uh, what I can tell you is that because of the, all 50 states now have a state concussion law. And uh, those state concussion law, they, uh, all of them require education. Uh, they require uh, no same day return to play after that concussion has been diagnosed. And they require that the uh, athlete be 
managed properly and returned to play only after they've been evaluated by uh, a physician or clinician with training in concussion management. So because of those laws, we're seeing more, the more injuries showing up in emergency departments, which is, you know, those that would have gone undiagnosed before. Uh, and so we're seeing a, about a 40% increase in the number of diagnosed concussions uh, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, at least the last 10 years, compared to where we were two decades ago. And so because of these increased, uh, what, what appears to be increased incidence of concussion, it's really an increased reported incidence of concussion. So I always caution people whenever they see this spike in these graphs that show, oh my goodness, look how many concussions we had today. Uh, it's really due to the, the better awareness around the, the injury and, and the, the job that the media has done uh, really to help. Uh, uh, the media, I was criticizing them earlier for having over-sensationalized this in some regards, but uh, with, with getting the awareness out around this topic, we've done a better job of getting more uh, athletes to, to be seen in emergency departments, et cetera. So uh, those were my last couple slides. The other thing I want to emphasize is that while we have, uh, you know, men's uh, football still sits at the top of the, uh, the list of uh, high school and, and collegiate, uh, or at least at the top of the high school list in terms of concussion incidents, uh, ice hockey, uh, boys lacrosse, uh, Women's soccer; the, those numbers are kind of on the, the on the rise as well. And cheerleading, believe it or not, uh, cheerleading uh, and the sport cheerleading concussions are also uh, uh, on, on the rise. And part of the problem there is that cheerleaders don't always have the safest place to practice, so they'll practice on concrete floors or tile floors in hallways. And uh, we think that's part of the reason why we see an increase uh, uh, in uh, in the incidence of, of concussions. In, uh, at the NCAA level, uh, a new study that was just published uh, about a month ago, month and a half ago, uh, football was still up toward the, the top, but uh, men's wrestling uh, led the way in terms of concussion into the state. And uh, ice hockey, uh, and uh, in both men's and women's ice hockey, actually fell just below men's wrestling and was actually had a higher incidence rate than uh, football did. So. Uh, uh, those are some of the, the, the newer statistics that are out on this. Not to suggest that we, we need to keep our eyes on the sport of football, because certainly it can be, be challenging. Uh, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to Jason, is that uh, uh, the big concern is what are the long-term effects? And uh, our Center for the Study of Retired Athletes, uh, that is in partnership with the, the, the work we do with the Feller Center, which focuses more on acute concussion, uh, we have the ability uh, to uh, to look at, at former athletes, uh, and uh, we, we have a, a big grant that's currently under review that will allow us to, to study former uh, NFL players and uh, former collegiate athletes and to look to see what the dose response is to sort of look at them years later after uh, you know, they, their last incident or their last concussion. And, uh, and so this work, I think, is really going to answer some important questions about, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this issue of CTE. There being a lot of uh, dots that still haven't been connected, and I think we're, gonna, uh, we're eventually going to get there through some of this work. So uh, that is, uh, we need these pr prospective longitudinal studies that, that I think uh, Carolina will be a leader in, uh, in being able to answer. So with that, I'm going to bring Jason up, and uh, we already had a great uh, introduction of Jason, uh, so I'm going to uh, get linked up here, and uh, Jason's going to talk to us about the work we're doing in the military. A few uh, years ago, uh, President Ross, who's the president of, for the, you know, the president of our uh, the state system here uh, had, in, in North Carolina, uh, with his good friends with uh, General from Fort Bragg, General Mulholland. And uh, he brought uh, the general and his uh, several of his physicians up to the Feller Center. We sat around the table and talked about how we might be able to work with the work that we're doing in the area of sport and concussion. Uh, into the military. And so uh, Jason, uh, you've already heard, this, is, this guy is a, a, a rising star in the field, uh, really helps to make things happen over the Fellow Center for us. Uh, we have, uh, when I counted the other day, our list 14 students working through uh, at, at our center, uh, including uh, former uh, students who are doing a great job with us. And I want to recognize uh, Corey Rodrigo, uh, who's with us. Corey is an alumnus of our program from uh, two years ago, 
and uh, he is the uh, research coordinator for this large uh, NCAA DOD project, and the project would not survive if it weren't for the great efforts of Corey uh, uh, helping us to lead the way. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jason and talk about the work we're doing uh, uh, both, uh, both with the NCAA athletes but uh, with the military. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks for the great work for the AV folks. Kevin tried to obviously sabotage my talk, and, 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 and so they came through and fixed it for us. Um, so it's a fitting day today for Kevin and I to be giving uh, this uh, Tar Heel tailgate, uh, given that it's Military Appreciation Day today. And so uh, Kevin's spoken a little bit about the foundational work that we've done in the sports field, um, and, and, and it's a nice carryover into the military work that we've been doing. Um, for the last 15, 20 years, Carolina has been a leader in athletic concussion research, and, and Kevin's been a pioneer and at the forefront of that. Um, and in the last three or four years, we've been working with some special operations forces uh, uh, programs down at Fort Bragg. So from a, ge from a geography standpoint, it's very close. They're an hour and a half away. And so they came up and met with us and, and explained their plight. And my daughter just walked in. Um, and their uh, plight is that they have some very highly skilled operators. Uh, the military invests a considerable amount of money into the seven figures to uh, have one of these operators be to the point where he or she is at. And when they're hurt, it's, it's, it's expensive. We're not talking about army at large where there's thousands of people that get deployed. And if someone's injured, there's, there's still thousands of others to accommodate. We're talking about smaller uh, teams of strategic um, operators that when one goes down, that, that could be 20 or 40% of the force that is going on any given mission. Um, so from our standpoint, we wanted to take the information that we've been capturing in the sports environment and relate it to uh, what we're seeing in the military environment. One of those initiatives is the NCAA DOD Grand Alliance that Kevin alluded to. Um, what you're seeing here is kind of another graphical depiction of what concussion is. We're seeing the head kind of bounce around inside the skull. Uh, typically in a sports environment, we see this being a sudden deceleration of the head. So think of a football, we're going to go see the game later. Uh, think of those head-to-head -head impacts where the head is traveling with the body down the field at some velocity, and then it comes to a sudden stop because someone has, has struck the head. Well, the brain inside is the passenger on the bus that slams on the brakes. They will still continue to kind of bounce forward and backwards. And that's what we're seeing with, with concussion. The injury is quite pervasive from a clinical standpoint. There's not just one cluster or one thing that we look for. You can see here ranging from, from cognitive abilities to balance to symptoms to, to previous injury history, there's, there's a whole myriad of components to traumatic brain injury that, that we don't fully understand, but we have certainly built uh, quite a good amount of knowledge base here at Carolina and with our colleagues across the country. What we're trying to achieve with this NCAA DOD Grand Alliance project is to get a better idea of what is happening to the athlete's brain over the course of injury and over the course, more importantly, of their recovery. And perhaps one of the issues that we're seeing with, with these long-term um, cognitive declines, if they are caused by head trauma, we still don't know that answer yet. It's going to take many years uh, to, to address that. But the idea is, are the instruments we're using now to identify and help us manage these injuries sensitive enough so that when we say, yes, they have cleared and they appear normal on these diagnostics, that they actually, in fact, have fully recovered from the injury from a physiologic standpoint, something underlying going on in the brain. And our instruments right now, the ones that we use today, aren't capable really of giving us the information to the level of the axon or the neuron that Kevin was talking about. It can give us kind of big picture ideas, visual memories impaired, verbal memories impaired, balance is affected, but it's not giving us the exact information over what part of that information superhighway in the brain is most impaired following that injury. Um, UNC is one of a few sites that has been hand-selected through this NCAA DOD Grand Alliance, in part because of the sophistication of the facilities, and Kevin alluded to the brick at, the, at, at Marsico Hall. Um, so we're doing neuroimaging, we're doing uh, biomechanics, so we're actually measuring forces of what's occurring at the level of the head of our athletes while they participate in competition. Um, and, and these are all pieces in, uh, uh, of, of, of clinical research information that we're hoping to garner so that we can then develop cost-effective tools that can be deployed in the field. It's a very ambitious program, and Kevin mentioned Corey's involvement in it. Again, without Corey's help, this, this could not be made possible. Uh, we test our athletes a lot following an injury. It's a very ambitious uh, pr protocol that, that we put them all through, and then I think Kevin and I would be remiss if we didn't thank our athletics department and the involvement of the teams and the athletes in the work that we do. But carrying over into military operations, 
<clears throat> I mentioned this, this elite force that we're working with, uh, very highly trained, skilled individuals, and the concern that we heard from their medical staff is these individuals are not normal. They are different from you and I, and what is unique and challenging for them uh, is, is, is beyond what we are physically and physiologically capable of doing. Um, and there are issues that even when impaired, the standard testing that they use, that we use with our athletes, are still showing these soldiers and these warrior athletes, as they phrase them, in the 95th, 96th, 98th percentile, while they're impaired. But they're not right. And so for us, not right means we can't focus in a classroom, or maybe we don't see the pass as effectively. Not right for them is the difference between a hostage and a hostage taker in an operation that they might have to endeavor in. So it's a very big, uh, complicated issue. I mentioned a lot of the testing that we do with our athletes has been part of this military model. Uh, we do neuroimaging over here at the brick in Marsico Hall, and I'll show you some, some, some graphics related to that. We also do a full plasma serum biomarker panel. The idea here is that maybe we can identify something where it could be a quick litmus test. We could, we could do a little pinprick on a finger, test the blood, and then say, yes, this person with some level of certainty is injured. We're not quite there yet, but this is the idea behind the uh, biomarker work that we're doing. Uh, vision and sensory performance is another area of research that we do in the center, and the military has been very interested in this from a performance enhancement standpoint. Can we operate more effectively in the field? But all the testing they do and all the training they do, in my mind, are diagnostics, are potential diagnostics to vision dysfunction following injury, and what they do to train to enhance their military readiness and performance, I'm looking at as a potential rehab tool for individuals that are suffering from vision following concussion or not suffering from vision, vision's good, suffering from vision deficits following the injury. And then lastly, there's a whole battery of standard clinical testing that we've been doing with our athletes now for, again, the last 15, 20 years that we are now applying to this special military population. What you typically see in a neuro CT or a MRI scan is kind of big brain. You, you, you see the lobes, you see the sulci, you see the brain as, as you envision the brain. What we're able to do with advanced neuroimaging techniques is to strip all that gray matter away and look at the information superhighways. We can get from here to Greensboro very fast if we jump on 40 and go 65, but if there's construction, we've gotta take 54. And we can still get there, but it's gonna take a little bit longer. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing these, these, these blocks of road, these 86 billion neurons being disrupted in a way that people have to somehow circumvent that to achieve the outcome of, of daily function. In the military world, it's, it's, it's operational readiness. Uh, so it's a very complex paradigm, and we're able to now to look at this at a level that we could not before because of the facilities that we have here at UNC. What does it mean clinically? Well, that's the challenge that Kevin and I and our colleagues have to work with over the next several years. In other words, you're not gonna go to the emergency department, get an MRI, and this is the picture that's gonna come out just yet. I mentioned the biomarkers. There, there's a whole uh, slew of information that's available in the blood. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's greatly affected by things other than head injury. Um, so we are looking at inflammatory markers, but if you get hit in the knee and you have an injury, you're gonna generate a change in these inflammatory markers. So it's not specific to head injury, and the DOD has poured millions and millions and millions of dollars into this holy grail of finding a blood test where they can take their operator in theater, pinprick them, put them on a, on a little test device and then say you're injured or you're not. We're just not quite there yet. Uh, but there's a lot of work that's being done and we're part of that here. So I mentioned the injury is quite pervasive. It affects many domains, many, many functions of uh, uh, brain, brain activity following injury. And then one area that we haven't really included over the last decade or so, but we're starting to now is this notion of vision. Um, Nike had developed a platform uh, that they used to take their elite athletes uh, out in Oregon and make them better by training the vision system. Eyesight is how well you can see. Vision is your ability to take that visual input, process it accordingly, and react on the field or in theater. Um, so very um, um, uh, popular among professional athletes and military. Um, and then Nike, for whatever reason, uh, their board decided we are a footwear and apparel company. And so they backed out of the tech game, at which point a startup company that I'm involved with has kind of spun off the technology uh, to start looking at it, again, in the performance space. And, and my area of interest is can this be used as a potential vision diagnostic and rehab? tool. Why is vision important? It's because we want people to be able uh, to observe their surroundings. What you're going to see here is in the thicket in the middle, uh, there's a, um, an enemy combatant that these operators are trying to hunt down. The thing moving very quickly towards the middle is a dog, um, has sniffed out the target. The operators are moving towards it. Again, they don't see it because it's, it's, it's a thicket. The one that's closest will engage. You'll see a couple flashes. 
That would be small arms fire right now. He falls back, stands up, gets back into it, and then the an explosive goes off. And so what this factors into are, are, are several levels of military readiness, is being able to see and being able to parse apart what is going on in the bush. Is it, is it animal, is it creature, is it enemy combatant, and then re react and respond accordingly. And then it also ties in this notion of blast, which we don't have to worry about on our football fields and our soccer fields, but it's another component of head trauma that the military does have to worry about. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, first, this is our, our laboratory experiment. We, 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 no, we don't do animal testing in our facility, um, but we do use a number of sensor devices, and, and we've been using them here at UNC for quite some time. The device that you see on the top left is instrumented in about 50 of our football players. So we've been working with our football program now for about 11 years. Um, some of the other smaller devices are helpful because we can put them and use them with athletes that, that don't wear helmets, right? A concussion isn't just a football problem. It happens in soccer, it happens in wrestling, it happens in lacrosse. Um, some of them are helmeted, some of them aren't. And so we need capabilities to measure these head impact forces uh, on the field. Again, what we see typically from a concussion standpoint in an athletic population is a sudden deceleration, typically a head impact, but it could be a, a body check or a tackle to the torso that causes this kind of whiplash mechanism. Uh, we see it a lot in motor vehicle crashes and, 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 and so forth. I mentioned blasts being unique to the military, and so the operators that we work with, uh, every time they go out and train or they deploy in theater, they are wearing three of these blast gauges on their person, um, and these blast gauges are designed to capture uh, blast waves and to record what magnitude of blast that, ath or that athlete, that warrior athlete was exposed to. Um, there's a light that'll trigger, a red light, a yellow light, a green light based on uh, kind of threshold levels of blast exposure. They don't go off until a medic at the forward operating base pushes a button on this device for obvious reasons. They do stealth operations and you don't want them having lights flashing off in the middle of the dark. Um, so the uh, little uh, sensor dome is, is what captures the blast. And then based on the information, there's one on their helmet, one on their torso, one on their back. We're able to kind of construct where the wave's coming from and the magnitude at which the wave struck them. So one uh, example here, and I'm, I'm borrowing slides from, from colleagues at DARPA that have funded some of this work over the last year. Um, you can see there's an um, armored uh, vehicle here driving down. There's, there's two operators, one on either side sitting on the exterior. There's a couple passengers inside. And the big burst you see underneath that front right wheel is an IED that this vehicle drove over. The benefit of working with this group of operators is there's, there's eyes on them all the time. Right? There's, there's drones all over. Some of them are doing lethal activities, others are doing surveillance, and they have a lot of surveillance here. And based on the surveillance and, and post-blast interviews with the operators, uh, DARPA is able to kind of create what that scenario looks like. And I just want to give you an example of what this blast on this screen would look like if you were driving in a Humvee. Okay, so a blast maybe a little bit lower than that is, is, is the one that's been modeled here. And what we're able to do with the blast gauges, you can see some of these, these individuals are green, yellow, red. This, this describes the level of blast exposure that particular warrior was exposed to in that scenario, in the one that, that, that we're talking about here. So the individuals inside, whoops. There you are, Jenna. Um, the individuals inside the vehicle um, are green. They, they were sheltered by the vehicle that they were in. Um, this individual here on the bottom right, you'll see, has a lot of red on their lower leg, and that's because their leg was hanging out of an open door. Um, and so if that door was closed, we can now kind of report back to it. We're, we're doing behavior modification with our athletes. We could do this with, with these folks. Close the door while you're driving, right? You could have saved your leg. Um, the individual that's sitting on the exterior of the vehicle on the back left, which was kind of the diagonal opposite the blast, um, appears fine, not a considerable amount of, of blast exposure. Uh, and the one on the right, you could see there's a lot of exposure to the back. Um, there's, some, there's some carry forward to this in the sense that uh, blast doesn't only occur from IED. Blast occurs from firing small arms. Blast occurs from firing heavy ordnance. Blast occurs from breaching a wall where there's no door and they want to create one. And who gets exposed and how they get exposed really affects the operational readiness of these operators. So that's all part of this bigger picture of, of identifying what are the clinical norms and going back to these people are not normal as, 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 as we know them. So how do we develop clinical norms that can help them manage brain injury when they occur? But then also importantly, how can we use this information that we're collecting daily through their training and their deployments to, to make sure that when they are operating that they are doing so in safe environments and so that they're safe in the process. 
So it has a lot of exposure or a lot of implications, not only to individual soldiers, but kind of fighting forces in general. Um, and one of the things that I'm really proud about, and I know Kevin is as well, is, is the work that we do, even though it's at a, at a fundamental level and we have great resources here at Carolina to help us with our work, the end goal is to put it in the hands of people who will actually use the research, right? So having it published in an article and sitting in an archive on the you know, seventh shelf of the movable uh, bookcase doesn't really help us. Um, we we want to put information in the hands of parents and players and coaches. And one thing that, or one project that we're doing is, is, is this behavior modification or the BMOD study where we're using that helmet technology at local high schools. We're using that information to identify athletes that we feel are hitting with an at-risk profile. In other words, those who are getting hit harder than their teammates and those that are hitting with a high frequency of top of helmet impacts, which is uh, illegal in football, and so we're trying to coach that out of them. And we're using this information, and, and originally the idea is that we would intervene at the level of the athlete, but we're actually intervening with the coaches. We're giving them the tools that they can identify athletes that are playing with at-risk technique and, 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 and help to coach it out of them. So that's part and parcel of what we're doing here. Again, we're putting our data and our research into the hands of coaches and parents and players to improve outcomes for those kids. Um, Bruce mentioned a smartphone app earlier. Uh, we know we can evaluate these injuries clinically. We have a lot of experience doing that, but it's, it's very daunting, even with the level of experience that Kevin, myself, and our colleagues have to manage some of these injuries, and parents just, just don't know. Um, and so what we did was we, we created this smartphone app where the parent can kind of walk through it and say, was there an impact, yes or no? What are some of the signs and symptoms to look for? It'll alert them to red flags that would warrant a 911 call, uh, any media transport, or gives them information to say, pull the athlete out, send them to the physician, here's the information that you have. One of the key benefits to the um, application is usually a parent's not out of practice. And so the coach says to the athlete who's injured, tell your mom that you felt like this when you had this impact. Well, of course, well, any teenage kid's going to forget that and not tell their parent anyway. But it's like that game of telephone where you whisper something in someone's ear and it goes to the next person, and it goes to the next person. And by the time you see your primary care physician three, four days later, that message of what happened on the field to what, what you're telling that doctor isn't carrying over. So what we can do with the smartphone app is record all of that, trigger off an email, it creates a report, so the physician can look at this report and say, this is how you felt at the time of injury, and this is how you felt since then. And that's very important information as they try to direct the care for that particular patient. We also intervene at the level of the clinician, and Arts and Science has been very gracious to, to help support our uh, symposium that we hosted last March. We hosted every other year. Uh, the athletics department has been a great supporter by allowing us access to the Blue Zone for this venue. Um, and and, and we've, we've had 300 people, 300 clinicians, whose sole responsibility is to manage these types of injuries in a clinical and a field environment, learn from us and the experts that we bring in from across the country and across the world. Uh, so we've been very fortunate to uh, innovate and socially on, entrepreneur in that regard. So at the end of the day, we want to identify what are the predispositions to sports injury and some of these chronic long-term issues that athletes may experience. Uh, we want to modify behavior, and we also want to change culture. And changing culture isn't as simple as, as, as you sitting in this room, and you're going to go off and change the way you behave. I hope I've been that effective, and I think Kevin hopes he's been that effective. But culture change takes a long time. Kids didn't wear bicycle helmets 20 years ago, and they do now. It takes a generation to change that culture, and we're trying to figure out ways that we can expedite the learning curve, if you will, and there's great colleagues in our center that do that. Uh, but I think that what we do well here at UNC and at the at the Gefeller Center is that innovative science can be a game changer. And we've done things over the last decade and a half to, to innovate our science into things that society can use every day. Um, and this is our team of game changers. And I think Kevin and I would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge them. And uh, Corey's in there. He's in the top right looking dapper in his shirt and tie. Um, so with that said, thank you for your time. It's a beautiful day. I was almost tempted not to come, uh, so, I, so I thank you for being here. Um, and uh, I think Kevin and I would be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.
I'll just say, the, I'll let Jason, I'll start, but the imaging piece is important. We tell uh, physicians, and believe me, that this, it has changed a lot. From many, for many of them had uh, their medical training 25, 35 years ago, and a lot has changed in this area as we've just talked about. But standard imaging just rules out something more serious. We tell them that you shouldn't assume that the individual, uh, you know, they need to uh, communicate this to the athlete and the parent, that they may see delayed onset of symptoms, even though that image is is normal and uh, and what those signs and symptoms are and, and the return to play progression that they should be put put through if once they've become asymptomatic in other words their symptoms have resolved and that's one of the newest things that that uh, that we we're validating right now is this return to play progression so starting them slowly with some exercise and progressing them through to where uh, if they clear each day on that they should be ready to go uh, within five to six days after that um, uh, you know the, that progression has begun, and so. Would that be true in return to work in yes, work absolutely. How does that play into workers' comp and all those kinds of labor issues? Well, I think depending on what what it is that the individual needs to do in their uh, essential job with their essential job functions, uh, that uh, we can modify that uh, progression, be it with slowly, uh, you know, introducing cognitive activities, even screen time. We have to minimize the amount of screen time uh, and gradually work them back into it uh, versus a more physical uh, job Then we may sort of gradually work their physical activity into it. I yeah, and I think from, from a construction standpoint, because you raised that industry in, in, um, as you contextualize your um, question, those injuries tend to be more severe when they occur, right? Think of what causes a, a, a head injury in a construction site, right? The heavy load being dropped on the head or a heavy object striking the head, uh, which, which is a little different. And the equipment they're using, sometimes they're not wearing a helmet, which, which is a big deal, or they're wearing a hard hat, which might not be sufficient to handle those, those types of impacts. So the, the, the type of injury, even though it's a head injury, may be subtly or, or very different from what we would see from a typical concussion in the sports field. Chance are full. So we're, we're working towards that. One of, uh, so, so it's an interesting thing. In sports that have the same playing rules between men and women's soccer, for example, a female, or the female version of the sport tends to have a higher injury rate among their participants. Uh, interestingly, when you look at ice hockey, females have a higher injury rate in ice hockey than, than, than males do, which is even, even more curious to me because men can body check in their rules and women can't. Um, and so the idea is that incidental contact occurs, you're 12 skaters with your goalies in, in an enclosed environment, a rigid environment, and you're gonna bump into people. So is the idea anticipation, is the idea that when you bump into someone, you don't expect to bump into someone because it's not a, a body collision sport, that, that the neck muscles aren't firing. Maybe it's less of a function of, of weak and more of a function of not firing it because you're not anticipating a collision. We don't have the answer to that yet. We just wrapped up a three-year study looking at youth ice hockey players. We're currently analyzing our data where we looked at, at muscle strength among uh, youth girls and youth boys ice hockey, um, and, and, and we're looking at a lot of those comparisons. So. Um, and, and if I could just add, I'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge uh, Jana Register Mihalik, uh, who's also here and uh, taking care of, of Jenna, but J Jana's work uh, at, our, at our center is uh, really uh, gonna be a game changer as well. She's looking at knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors uh, of, of concussion and what athletes and parents and how they respond uh, with respect to uh, what they know about concussion and how they'll be willing to report concussion. So with Chancellor Fultz's question, I think what you also heard me mention previously is that women are more willing to report concussion, more willing to report their symptoms uh, my wife would say, based on a sample of four, uh, three boys and a little girl, that girls are more honest than boys. Uh, I have no idea if there's truth to that, but uh, in our small sample, that seems to be the case. And so th that we're challenged by that, too, to really know, are women or girls more uh, truly uh, more predisposed to it and their symptoms last longer, or is it just that they're willing to report it and the, the boys are hiding it? So John is going to figure that out for us eventually.
Yeah, so the, the population that we work with is very limited from the female side of things, uh, just, just given the history of the unit that, that, that we work with. Um, we have evaluated a number of females from a performance standpoint. Um, they've done a really nice job of recruiting these women because they perform at or above what we've seen in the male counterparts. Uh, from vision sensory performance, they seem to be just as resilient to previous head trauma as their male counterparts. Uh, but again, we are dealing with a very biased uh, elite group of operators. How that permeates into Army at large is, is kind of the next frontier, and it's what our group that we're working with wants us to do. They, they want us to use their operators, captive environment, on the other side of the fence and then take that information and apply it so all of the armed forces and armed services can benefit. I think there's a question over here. Yeah, I think it's been slow, uh, but uh, I think people recognize that the sport of football is under sort of this microscope right now. Um, in fact, this will be the topic of, I think, uh, uh, 60 Minutes tomorrow evening we'll be featuring this, and our work is supposed to be featured in that, in that show if it airs as it's planned. I know that the, uh, the Paris uh, situation uh, may take precedent, but at any rate, there, it will be there. And we've talked about this in there, that this culture change, both at the NFL and the NCAA, we, we, there has been a trickle down. We know that uh, there are rules changes that we've helped to institute both at the NFL and the NCAA level with the kickoff rule. Uh, I sat here in Chapel Hill with, uh, uh, I represent the, NC, or the ACC on their concussion uh, committee and uh, John Swafford, the commissioner, came over for lunch a few weeks ago and we were talking about this and we actually talked about the possibility of changing the punt because we see a disproportionate number of concussions on the, the punt as well. So we've, we've made a lot of improvement with the kickoff. So uh, we may see a, a change in the punt as well uh, soon. So, but uh, there, we need the, the culture change has been too slow in my opinion. They do, and, and so what we know is that uh, there's a high, uh, in, in boxing for instance, uh, we see a high uh, incidence of, um, of Parkinson's in, in, in boxers, uh, as well as in some of the retired players, we're seeing it now in off some offensive linemen who played many years, and so the question is what is it about those repetitives, uh, repetitive subconcussive insults that we see uh, in, in those particular athletes. Uh, Parkinson's has been understudied, in my opinion, uh, w with respect to, in our large database of about 3,300 former NFL players, surprisingly we see a small uh, incidence of, 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 uh, of cases after the age of 50 of Parkinson's relative to mild cognitive impairment, which involves more memory and, you know, as opposed to the motor changes. So I think we have, we, we have to better understand it, and I, I do think that there is a, a link to the repetitive subconcussive just based on the boxing uh, literature and the linemen in football, but uh, we haven't been able to fully connect the dots similar to what we have with, you know, as I mentioned earlier, with CTE. Well, thank you. This has been uh, been, been great. Uh, I hope uh, it's a great day for the Tar Heels. It will be a great day for the Tar Heels, and uh, I, I, we really appreciate you being here. So, thank you. <laughs>